Well, good morning. I just wanted you guys to know how much I miss you. It's great to be here with fewer than 10 people separating ourselves appropriately, but we really miss you. And um, I pray that God is blessing you right where you are. And I'm praying that he will open our eyes today to see beautiful things in his word. I have learned that we really take for granted the privilege of joining together here in worship. It's just something that I assume we will always do. Have you ever thought about what it really means to take something for granted? It, it means, according to the dictionary, that we never have to think about it because we believe it will always be available and that it is at some level immutable, that it will never change. I'm reading a fabulous book, Nelson Mandela's autobiography on a long walk to freedom, and it's making me painfully aware of the freedoms that we enjoy here that I certainly take for granted. And of course, the COVID-19 situation has revealed some things that we take for granted as well, like handshakes and hugs, toilet paper, going to the movies, raise baseball, NBA basketball, water, which I'm thankful to say I believe still comes out of the faucet if you get desperate, paper towels, lightning hockey, school, small groups, worshiping together as a body of Christ, dine-in restaurants, days at the beach, medical appointments, and even for some, we've learned not to take our jobs for granted. See, when we're taking things for granted, we're actually never stopping to think about where they came from or how they became a part of our everyday lives. This week, I took some time to actually think about some of the beautiful elements of our faith that we have a tendency to take for granted. The privilege that I decided rises to the very top for New Covenant believers, that is, believers in Jesus Christ, is actually the privilege of prayer. Have you ever stopped to consider how we were given that ability and why? What we're going to do today at the cross is consider the privilege of prayer. And my hope is that it will help as you begin to appreciate the privilege of prayer, that you will also increase the amount of time you spend exercising it. Here's what the writer of Hebrews said in Hebrews chapter 4 beginning in verse 14. Hebrews chapter 4, beginning in verse 14. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence. He's talking about prayer. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Now, we know that through an active faith in Jesus Christ, we can always go boldly to God in prayer. And, and this freedom has actually sometimes given way to a casual, a even cavalier or disrespectful approach as if we think God is just one of the guys. But let me tell you, historically, that perspective would be met with astonishment. In the Old Testament, people couldn't just communicate with God directly. They actually had to go through a priest. And a priest or a prophet would either get a word from God directly or 
get a word from his word, the law, and they would speak with the people on God's behalf. Conversely, the priest would go to God on behalf of the people. They would be able to, to speak with God to actually pray for the people who did not enjoy that privilege. The priest served as a go-between or a mediator between people and God. But under the old covenant, here's what we need to understand. The people had no direct access to God. And, and the fact is that even the priest had limited access. God's presence was actually shut off from the people behind a curtain or what we call the veil of the Holy of Holies. It was true in the first tabernacle that was built by Moses as a place to host God's presence. And it was true of the temple built by Solomon. Now, according to the system of worship that was prescribed by God, it was only once a year. Now, I want you to think about this. Once a year the priest was given access to God. And it happened on the Day of Atonement where the priest and only the high priest was allowed to enter his presence. And, and even then, it was a very precise, nerve-wracking process. See, here, here's what he had to do. First, he had to go through the process of making himself ceremonially clean. That is, he, he would make a sacrifice for his own sins. And then he would carefully, respectfully, even nervously enter God's presence behind the veil with the blood of a lamb that he would offer as a sacrifice for the unintentional sins of the people. But that only happened once a year and no one else ever dared go into God's presence. There, there was tremendous fear associated with being in the presence of God because he was holy and his wrath against sin was nothing to be trifled with. Listen, even the priests who were designated to go into his presence did so knowing that one wrong move, if they stepped out of line in any way, God's wrath would break out against them. So here's what would happen on the Day of Atonement. The high priest, preparing to go in before God, would affix bells to his robe and tie a rope around his ankle. Why? Because as long as he was in the Holy of Holies, ministering before God, the people on the outside could hear those bells ringing. But if those bells ever fell silent, then the people outside the Holy of Holies would know that the high priest had incited God's wrath, and they would then have to pull his body out with that rope. So going into God's presence was risky business. Risky business. And they did so very soberly. So it was with the priest who was entering on behalf of the people. Now, let's juxtapose their experience with ours. What was their mindset and what is ours? They were denied access to God. And the one person once a year who could go in did so soberly with great reverence and even with fear. And so people have gone from being afraid of God's presence and speaking to speaking directly to him. Even being invited to enter God's presence boldly. And some have gone so far. Listen, just think about this. Some have gone so far and become so cavalier as to call God the big man upstairs. To act as if God is a buddy. To, to, to act as if it's not just a privilege to enter God's presence, but it's an entitlement. Why? 
How have we come so far? Because we've forgotten how that privilege was secured. We take for granted the fact that we can pray any time. So what happened? Where, where did things change? What, what took place and where did it take place that gives us this privileged access? Well, it took place at the cross. Turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 15. And we're going to begin reading in verse 25. Mark chapter 15, beginning in verse 25. Here's what the scripture says. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. They crucified two rebels with him, one on his right and one on his left. And those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. And in the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, this King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, listen, he's calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. And with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last and the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, Surely, surely this man was the Son of God. Now, obviously, the death of Jesus at the cross is what established this change, our ability to pray forever. But there was a visible signal, a symbol that announced the change, and, and it's announced in, in a short but momentous statement that Mark makes in verse 38. After Jesus breathed his last, which John tells us he breathed his last with the words, It is finished. Verse 38, Mark says, this is what happened. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now, with that remarkable and, and let me say, miraculous event, the old covenant, whereby people were afraid to enter the presence of God, was completely obliterated. It was finished. And the new covenant was enacted. Now, no longer were worshipers forbidden to enter the presence of God. But now, instead of relying on their priest, now they were able to enter the presence of God in freedom. Knowing that they, by the blood of Jesus, could actually interact with the Creator, God. Everyone now who comes in the name of Jesus can relate to God on a personal basis, entering his presence, I think, with grateful reverence for the price paid and the way made. Now, 
There are a couple of things about this event, the tearing of the curtain, that, that I think should solidify our wonder and prevent us from moving toward taking it for granted. It should elevate our appreciation for exactly what Christ did on the cross. And the first thing I would say is that we need to understand the tearing of the veil was an incredible miracle. It was a miraculous event. That veil was indestructible. Listen, the, the, the Jewish historian Josephus tells us that the veil was 80 feet tall. Think about that. 80 feet tall and 4 inches thick. The veil that kept people out of the presence of God, that actually protected people from the presence of God and His holiness, was 80 feet tall and 4 inches thick. Now, think about that. Conservatively, that means that the veil was taller than a five-story building. And when that curtain was hung, historians tell us that they employed as many as 300 priests to raise it in its place. It, it was just that heavy and just that tall. And, and you can imagine what a system of scaffolding had to be employed to get that thing to its 80 foot height. The idea was that no person could ever climb high enough to bring it down. And everybody knew that. Everybody knew that the curtain was indestructible. That no one could get it down. And that's important to remember because Mark reports that it was torn not from bottom to top, but it was torn from top to bottom, signifying that God Himself reached out of heaven and tore that veil. Now, but to me... The height of the veil isn't even the most remarkable part. It was the thickness. Now, four inches thick doesn't seem like a lot. I, I looked around for something to illustrate what might be four inches thick. And this Christmas, I actually got myself a, a study Bible. This is the grandmother's coffee table version, large print edition. This is a big Bible, but it is only two inches thick. Two inches. So the veil, the curtain, was actually double this thickness. Think about the thickest fabric you have ever seen. And this curtain was four inches thick. In other words, that curtain was indestructible. You couldn't cut it, much less rip it. Yet, God reached out of heaven and tore it himself. And anyone there would have known that God did it. You say, well, yeah, but nobody was there. Well, not so. And that's the second aspect of this event that heightens our wonder and increases our faith. It, it's the timing of the crucifixion that makes all the difference. Now, remember I said, Mark said that Jesus cried out in a loud voice and then the veil was torn. John reports that what Jesus said was, it is finished. And when he said, it is finished, the veil was torn in two. And there were people in the temple to see it. See, here's what we know from Mark's account. Jesus' crucifixion began at 9 a.m. in the morning. And then Mark tells us that at noon, darkness fell over the entire earth. That, that darkness signified that he who knew no sin was becoming sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. And that darkness, Mark says, lasted until three in the afternoon when Jesus announced, it is finished. And at that moment, when it was finished, the veil in the temple was torn from top to bottom. So, think about this. Guess what was happening at precisely 
3 p.m. The high priest was nervously with bells on his robe and a rope around his ankle. The high priest was nervously entering the Holy of Holies. That was the time prescribed by God for the yearly sacrifice of atonement to be made. And knowing the precision with which they did everything they did, we know he was there. And we know those people holding the other end of the rope were on the outside. Now, I I don't know how often you put yourself in really nervous, jumpy situations. But typically when we do, loud noises or sudden starts freak us out. Now remember, the high priest is entering into God's presence very nervously. He's Walking on eggshells, hoping that he does everything right because he doesn't want the wrath of God to break out against him. And so suddenly he goes behind the veil and at three in the afternoon, that veil is ripped from top to bottom. I am shocked that we don't read. They pulled him out with the rope. He was there. He was offering a lamb for sacrifice, while at the same time, the Lamb of God was shedding His blood and finishing His work and finishing off the old covenant and implementing the new. More than what happened is why it happened. More important is why it happened. Why was it torn? Previously, before Jesus' death on the cross, the high priest, as we said, would enter the presence of God every year. The blood of the Lamb that he offered didn't solve the sin problem. That's why he had to enter year after year after year. That ceremony was repeated annually, reminding the people of of God's willingness to forgive them and of God's need to forgive them. But the scripture tells us that the sacrificial system that culminated, that peaked with the entrance of the high priest into God's presence, it was just a shadow of the real thing to come. One day... They knew a sacrifice would actually be made to perfect the system. The real thing would would really take away the sins of the world once and for all. And so Jesus, the great high priest, enters the Holy of Holies at the prescribed time with the blood of the Lamb, His own blood, that was shed for the forgiveness of all sin once and for all. His offering was one and done. It was permanent. And now, because sins are forgiven, we we have access to God's presence. See, the Scripture tells us that because Jesus died for us, when we place our faith in Him, we are made holy. It's through His blood offered at the cross And now because we are holy, no barrier stands between us and the holy God. Listen how the writer of Hebrews summed up what happened in Hebrews chapter 10, beginning in verse 19. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus... By a new and living way opened up for us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience And having our bodies washed with pure water. Now what is he telling us? 
The writer is telling us that the real curtain, remember I said that all the things about the temple were symbolic. The sacrifices were symbolic. The the setup was symbolic. The veil was symbolic. What he's telling us is that the real curtain that was torn was the body of Jesus. And when his body was broken and his blood was shed, a new way, a, a living way was opened up for us. And now because Jesus' blood has cleansed us from all our sins, we have the privilege, the distinct privilege that should be exercised continuously of drawing near to God in the holy place. We can come to His throne of grace and mercy because Jesus made the way. Now we can speak to God on our own. We don't have to go through a priest. Because that veil was torn, we can bring our requests, our concerns, our worries, our praises straight to God. Just as God desires. That's how he wanted it from the beginning. His desire all along was to have a relationship with the people that he created to love. Yet, we know that sin separated us from His holiness. But through Christ, we now become holy. He became, remember, He became sin who knew no sin, so that we might become the righteousness, the holiness of God. So we get to enter God's presence. And in this life, and by the way, we are guaranteed to live in His presence in the next one. See, at the cross, Jesus, who was the way, made the way. The veil was torn in two. And all who believe, all who come in his name, can enter the presence of God boldly and confidently. The beautiful thing is we are no longer locked out of the Holy of Holies and God is no longer locked in. The perfect sacrifice was offered and accepted. And if we accept by faith that Jesus made the offer on our behalf, then all the benefits are ours. We can enter the presence of a holy God without fear. Because Christ fulfilled, finished the sacrificial system, no more sacrifices remain. The work was done. That's why we don't have to make up for our failure. That's why we don't have to work our way to God. Jesus finished it on the cross and the veil was torn and the presence of God was made available. It was finished. The question is, was it finished for you? See, have have you come to the place in your journey that you have accepted the sacrifice that Christ made so you can be in relationship with God. See, it's not, it's not about coming through a priest. Your priest doesn't have to accept it for you. It's not about coming through your parents. It's not their faith that will connect you with God. It's not about the good works you do or the bad things you avoid That doesn't connect you with God. It is about faith in Jesus. And what he did on the cross. The way to enter God's presence and live in his presence in this life and the life to come is to place your faith in him. So let me ask you a question. Are you coming through Christ? Have you placed your faith 
in what the Lamb of God did for you. He came to take away the sin of the world. And if you have placed your faith in him, are, are you respectfully, reverently, exercising the privilege of prayer? Or are you taking it for granted? I can't imagine how those who followed God in the old covenant would respond to the way we follow him in the new covenant. They would be astonished at the privilege that we have that we so often take for granted. Let's live in gratitude that the veil was torn from top to bottom. Will you bow your heads and pray with me? First, I just want to invite you to consider if you've actually placed your faith in Jesus Christ. Maybe you're, you're home watching today, you've tuned in, and, and you, you realize that it's not personal for you. Maybe you've identified with a religion or you've identified with your parents or a priest or whatever and, and now you recognize that Christ died for you, for God so loved you that he gave Jesus, his only begotten son. And today the Holy Spirit is drawing you to place your faith in Jesus. I just want to encourage you to open your heart right now. Thank God for the sacrifice of Christ. Thank God that the veil was torn. And trust Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life who brings you to the Father. Lord, for those who may be opening their heart right now, Lord, we know that your word teaches us it's never too late. Our sins were not too great. All, they were all covered by Jesus' blood at the cross. So I pray, Father, that for those who don't know you, they would have the, the courage to enter the joy of eternal life. To enter your presence here and to be guaranteed your presence there. Jesus, we thank you for dying for us. May we live in light of your love. And Father, for those of us who take for granted the privilege of living in your presence, we ask your forgiveness. We repent. Lord, we want to change our direction. And we want to be people of prayer. Celebrating. The fact that through the sacrifice of your son, we can come boldly into the throne of grace. We bless your name, Lord. We thank you for loving, enough, loving us enough to die for us. Thank you for turning our lights on. And now, Lord, let our lights shine. It's in the strong name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. I, am, uh, I really do miss you guys, but we're, we're going to be uh, meeting together Sunday mornings at 1030 and Wednesday nights at, if the veil's not torn in between, and Wednesday nights at 7, and I'll, I'll see you there. We're doing a Bible study on Wednesday nights about uh, some great stories of faith in the scripture, and I'll look forward to to seeing you then and next Sunday. Have a great day. God bless you and keep you. Cause his face to shine upon you and give you peace.